Okay, so just a couple quick notes um, from last week and general items. Um, as I said briefly on Friday, uh, I appreciated everyone's global news group reports. Um, in terms of overall feedback, I think the presentations from um, each of the groups was good. We heard a range of you know, different types of stories and obviously from different parts of the world given the structure of the projects themselves. In terms of one piece of critical feedback, just a reminder um, to the groups when you're putting together your um, written document, uh, make sure you have your group name and region and all of your group members at the top and then your couple major headlines and then the kind of extra details of your stories. Some people were a little loose with that general framework and that'll help to give us all sort of a similar set of presentations. Um, but if folks want to include the hyperlinks to the stories and other materials, that's fine. Um, just make sure you have that kind of main information at the top, your group and region, and that folks in that region. Okay. Um, a quick reminder, we'll have our first quiz um, this Friday, which will cover weeks one through four, so the beginning of our readings um, through lectures this week. Um, I'll be sending out in the next day or so a both a sample quiz just to give a new idea of sort of what to expect, um, as well as a study guide of sort of key terms and concepts to help you think about what you need to review um, in advance of that. Um, any questions before we get going today? Okay, so we're turning to think about um, ideologies and particularly different confrontations over globalization, right? This question we've been exploring for a while now, is globalization good? Is globalization bad? Is it a bit of both? And sort of how would we make those determinations? So just to kind of begin our framing for this um, topic, you should remember our author pointed out that ideologies themselves, the idea of ideology, is essentially a powerful system of shared beliefs and ideas that help us make sense of the world around us and essentially tell us um, what is right or what is wrong. And in particular, ideologies tend to reflect the dominant sort of group in society. So you can have competing ideologies, but there's usually one sort of dominant political or economic ideology. And as our author said, these essentially serve as sort of maps or quick references to help us orient ourselves in relationship to a whole range of different issues that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. And as you can see the image there, so we think about sort of generically politics, describing people as liberal or conservative on the right or on the left. And that idea actually goes back to the French Revolution in 1789. You can see a picture there where you had the sort of revolutionary Republicans, the Jacobins on the left side. This is in the French National Assembly. And the more sort of monarchist and um, conservative political factions, those representing the church and the monarchy in particular at that moment in French history, sitting on the right. So thanks to that sort of odd moment of French history, much of the world has sort of taken those two ideas, the left and the right. The left at that moment, the end of the 1700s, representing this new emerging republican you know, republicanism, not in the Democrat-Republican sense, but republicanism in the way we think of liberal democracy today, versus that sort of earlier moment of European history where the church and the monarchy dominated much of politics. But because of that legacy, we still tend to think of a lot of politics in terms of left and right. right? So this is just one of many possible examples um, we could look at trying to think about how do we map political ideologies. Right? We can think about our relationship to a whole range of different values, about the family, about religion, um, about the market, about our communities. And if we sort of sat down as a group and tried to map out how do we think about a whole range of um, social and cultural and economic and political ideas, we would find that a key part of those discussions and those debates revolve around what is our sort of central reference point. Traditionally, we tend to think of the left as being more in favor of 
bigger government, social interventions, things like welfare state, social security, universal education, universal college, ideas like that. Whereas we tend to think more of conservatives as being more fiscally conservative, so smaller government, less government spending, less government intervention into our lives. Right? We can think about the idea and these underlying philosophies playing out right now with COVID and mask mandates, right? On one hand, you have folks that say, you know, the government shouldn't be intervening into my life and telling me how you know, I make my individual decisions about being vaccinated, wearing masks, and other things, versus people that say, well, the government's obligation to impose certain you know, public health and safety measures in order to ensure the common good. Right? So there's this sort of tension between what do we prioritize, the individual freedom and choice, or the sort of collective good of society and the public. And we can imagine these playing out in a whole different range of issues. But the challenge is, regardless of what type of ideology we're talking about and what sort of label we might use, it goes back again to partly, A, what is our center? So left of what, right of what? We can't decide what's left or right without having a center. And also that that question will be answered very differently if we're talking about you know, our views on government, our views on the economy, our views on social liberties, and a whole range of issues. So in a sense, trying to map ideologies is actually one of the hardest challenges that political scientists, sociologists, and others wrestle with, precisely because of the ambiguity that's involved in how we map different ideologies. Right? We can do a lot based on these left-right assumptions, but we're making a lot of assumptions in that process. Now, Stegers talks about sort of three key ideologies or sort of reactions to these globalizing processes, this global imaginary that we've been discussing so far in class. And these are the market globalism, justice globalism, and religious globalism. Right? And his argument is, and others as well, these are three sort of key organizing concepts to think about how people around the world have responded to these complex set of global processes that we've been exploring, right? political, cultural, economic, and others. And each of these, although they're responding to the same dynamics, brings a different sort of ideology and ideological lens to thinking about questions of value, what is good, um, and sort of what is the ideal vision for how we organize society. So as we talked about a little bit already when we looked at issues of economic globalization, the market globalists and the kind of the idea of market globalism really emerged in the 1980s and the 1990s, um, particularly in relationship to, as you can see pictured there on the bottom left, Ronald Reagan in the United States and Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom. And this is the sort of moment, if you remember, we were talking about the economic crisis in the 70s that led the U.S. to delink the U.S. dollar from the gold standard under Nixon and the sort of changing politics that took place in that sort of post-70s and early 18, 1980s period. And you can see the sort of five main, we might say, ideological leanings or sort of assumptions that are often made or arguments by market globalists. The key idea that globalization is really about the liberalization of trade, right? so deregulation, opening up markets, reducing restrictions, in order to create a more integrated global market rather than lots of these regional markets. And that this process of increasingly integrated global economies and politics and cultures is essentially inevitable and irreversible. So it's something that is almost meant to happen and is sort of evolutionarily foreordained. And our goal is just to make it work as best as we can. Because ultimately, nobody is in charge of globalization. Right? This is the classic Adam Smith, the invisible hand of the market. Right. We're all individually contributing, corporations are individually contributing, but there's no single overarching person shaping the global economy. 
And we have institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank and the World Trade Organization that lay sort of ground rules and put laws in place to frame how these interactions take place, but they're not actually controlling it. And then most importantly, the last two claims there. First, that globalization itself furthers the spread of democracy. So this idea that free trade equals democracy, which is a key claim that the justice globalism we'll look at in a minute has called into question. And then based on that idea that as free trade spreads, democracy increases, that globalization ultimately benefits everyone. Right, so as free trade integrates economies, big and small, all over the world, people have more opportunities to participate in those markets and in that process increase their livelihoods and well-being. And this was famously summed up by Margaret Thatcher there. You can see in the little thought bubble, there is no alternative, or TINA as it's often referred to, right? This sort of free market democratic liberalism particularly in the aftermath of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union in 91, became sort of the leading dominant political and economic ideology all over the world. And if you'll recall when we talked about cultural globalization, some people also said, well, this is the final signal of a kind of Western European-led cultural imperialism, right, where English language, Hollywood images, Western values became the dominant cultural sort of standard that was wrapped up with discussions about what it means to be free or to have democratic politics. So all of these trends for market globalists were seen as powerful, important, and in a sense, inevitable. Now, by the time we get into the sort of mid-1990s, these ideas are increasingly being called into question by scholars, by people on the ground in community organizations and social movements. And they're sort of asking two main questions, which we've talked a little bit about already in relationship to both economic and political globalization. One of those key claims is that we've seen a continuing number of economic crises, the 2008-2009 global financial crisis being the most recent one, but there were earlier ones in the mid-1990s in East Asia related to the Thai bot and uh, speculation around housing there and in other parts of the world. And the argument is that this constant drive for profit as the dominant sort of mode of operating itself leads us to take increasingly risky economic and political decisions that often are backed up by less than accurate readings of the world and are based more on how we'd like to imagine the market working, which ultimately lead to potential crisis and crash when they turn out to be assumptions that aren't actually grounded in reality. And so, as they argue there, many times we've seen through this idea of the Washington Consensus, the deregulation, liberalizing trade, cutting social spending through these austerity programs and various uh, foreign-imposed structural adjustment programs that came with loans from the IMF or the World Bank, that those that things themselves are actually driving increasing social inequality and leading to this increasing gap between the haves and the have-nots that we looked at a little bit in the context of economic globalization. So yes, globalization is good for some people, but the benefits are not necessarily distributed equally within society. It's a key argument made as a pushback by um, sort of justice globalism. Also, this idea that democratic participation is essential. We've seen this play out here in the United States around campaign financing and the role of um, dark money in financing politics and elections and campaigns. Right. What happens when money becomes equivalent to political speech and expression? And some people have way more money and therefore can speak much more loudly and more frequently um, than others. How do we manage those tensions within a democratic society? You can see there the idea that another world is possible, the famous slogan of the World Social Forum, 
which emerged 2001 in response to a lot of these globalizing dynamics, particularly in relation to the World Economic Forum, a sort of a people's response. You can, as you can see in that last bullet there, people power, not corporate power, Occupy Wall Street turned this into 99% versus the 1%. Right? This idea that ultimately globalization, both economically and politically, is best when it serves all the people rather than some of the people. And that's a, a key critique of this broader market globalism, that too often it doesn't benefit all the people, but rather just some of the people. And then finally, religious globalism is a little harder to simply, uh, sort of simply characterize because we have so much religious diversity around the world both within the major world religions and smaller religious traditions. But Sager argues that, one, we're seeing the increasing importance of discourses about creating global communities through shared religious identities. And that could be through missionaries, that could be through the idea of the Uma or the religious community or community of faith. And this can take many sort of different expressions. But it's increasingly religion moving beyond a regional context and into a more global context. And unfortunately, we've been seeing an increasing role of violence within religious communities, often tied to religious extremism. And as we can see there on the bottom, expressions of sort of patriotism and nationalism wrapped up with Hindu identity in India, the rise of ISIS and ISIL within sort of Islamic jihadist organizations, and on the bottom right there, the increasing role of Christian nationalists and Christian militias like the Oath Keepers and Three Percenters and others who have wrapped up politics and religion in complicated ways um, that no longer are confined within just one individual national boundary. And so as Steger says there, a key point about the religious globalisms is that these ideologies aim at global hegemony and demand to be given primacy and superiority over state-based and secular political structures. Right, so at a broader level, what we're seeing happen is this um, turn back, in a sense, questioning the not only liberal democ democratic politics, but the underlying secular associations that went with those. Right, so here in this country, we think about the separation of church and state. Right, that was central to the American Constitution and U.S. politics um, from that time forward. And that's true in many other countries, probably nowhere more clear than in France with La Cité, the sort of French secularism. Right, but that idea that religion, it should be here, politics should be here, and the two uh, need to always sort of stay separate, that assumption is increasingly breaking down as we get more uh, vocal religious leaders elected, particularly religious populists or religious nationalists, and as religious parties increasingly gain political influence. Groups like the BJP um, in India is one of many possible examples. So Steger argues, and many others looking at these globalizing trends, that these three sets of dynamics, the market globalism, the justice globalism, and religious globalisms, are three different responses to the same kind of dynamics, but played out um, in very different ways. So you can see, for example, going back to 1975 up to 2015, we've seen in general a decline of those sort of mustard colored there, the non-religious conflicts since the 70s, but we've seen a steep increase in religious issue conflicts and a decline, but not nearly as uh, significant of a decline in those religious identity conflicts. And some of those, unfortunately, have gone up if we had 2015 to 2021 data there as well. And so what we're seeing is increasing connection between religion and violence, particularly in relationship to communal politics. Now, as Sager talks about, there's a number of different reasons that we could think about to try to explain why are these dynamics going on. You know, we've had major financial crisis here and in Europe and other parts of the world that are 
harming people. We're losing money out of our pocketbooks, out of our bank accounts, out of our investments. We're not making as much because our wages aren't rising to match inflation. A lot of public services we've relied on are either being cut or reduced significantly. Oftentimes, when we do have financial crisis, it ends up being sort of the big corporations and the large banks that end up getting bailed out because it's believed that if they crash, the repercussions could be even more severe. But what that usually also means is that the average people who are losing money and wealth um, take the brunt of those losses instead of the businesses and other interests. And we're all also seeing as demographic shifts take place in the United States and across Europe, um, increasing questions about what is our identity as people of X country, both in the past and possibly in the future, and how do we feel, how do we react to these changes? Right? From, on one hand, encouraging and welcoming migrants and refugees, to the other hand, building walls and putting in place laws and policies to try to prevent um, further migration. And so we can see both of these trends playing out simultaneously, and they're both in different ways driving some of these broader sort of anti-globalist and populist politics. And so we can think about here in the United States, the election of Donald Trump in 2016, the vote to leave or Brexit in the United Kingdom in that same year. And more broadly, we're also seeing the increasing rise of sort of populist and nationalist political leaders or strong men um, around the world, as the chart in our readings this week um, highlighted. And so as you can see there in that quote, this idea that the great experiment of globalization that we all thought was going to benefit us, those benefits are increasingly being called into question by um, larger sections of society around the world, and that's leading to this desire for something else, right, an alternative. Exactly what that alternative might be could vary. It could be a Donald Trump, it could be a Bernie Sanders. Right? There's lots of different ways that those could play out in national context. One of the challenges when we think about these dynamics is that they're not linked to any particular country or region or necessarily even religious tradition. These are dynamics that are playing out almost equally around the world in many cases. And key to these ideas, as you can see there in the bottom left, the sort of the national populist imaginaries, right? Part of this sort of ideologies that we've been reading about based on this sort of mythical idea of what the nation was and often that linked to ideas of um, race, ethnicity, and culture. And in particular, the idea that we, the people, are under attack by a sort of corrupt both domestic elites as well as uh, foreign threats. Right? So you think about in the most recent case here in the United States with President Trump, you have the idea of making America great again, right? MAGA. You have the idea that you need to drain the swamp of all that political corruption. Right? You have a fake news and political elites who are out to undermine the administration and their politics. And you have these outside political agents and actors um, who are seen as hostile threats to the strength of American democracy, American power, um, and American politics. And we see that kind of similar argument playing out at lots of levels around the world, um, not just here in the United States. So consider this following clip as one sort of example of these dynamics. So obviously the parallel there between Australia and the United States, there's some, I would say, examples that make sense. The key difference there, as one of the last speakers said, is that we don't have the sort of diversity of political parties as they do in Australia, so you don't have um, competing populist parties. They've largely fallen under either Democratic or Republican umbrellas here, but in much of the rest of the world where it's not a two-party dominated system, and that's much less true in the you are seeing much more competition from these uh, sort of populist parties. 
Um, as Steger said, we're seeing right, an increased growth of these sort of strongman um, political leaders or candidates running for office um, from all across the sort of political spectrum and all across different um, countries in the United States. And importantly, as you can see, from 2008 to 2018, so 2008 being that lighter blue line and 2018 being the darker one, pretty much every country has seen a significant rise um, in populist parties in that time period. The red arrow there on Belgium is really the only visible exception. So in that sort of 10-year period, right, you had the global financial cri crisis, you had the Greek sovereign debt crisis, issues in Spain and Italy, and they're all leading to this sort of phenomenon that we just heard a little bit about there in that last video of rising um, populist parties. Some countries we've seen dramatic increases, others just uh, a slight increase, um, but the overall trend is uh, significant growth. Now, Steger talks about here in the United States, sort of the populist and sort of nationalist expression of these anti-global sentiments um, have often been kind of wrapped up in this label of Trumpism, this idea that the corrupt elites are betraying the hardworking American public for the benefit of these global elites who themselves are getting sort of rich and powerful from these processes. And that these same elites themselves are sort of undermining or compromising not only U.S. political sovereignty, but also our homeland, our national security, so here referenced mostly to borders, um, and also wasting America's wealth. Probably most clearly articulated in this idea of America first, rather than globalism as uh, sort of a key part of Trump's campaign, and um, it continues to be sort of post uh, his presidency. And then finally, the, the sort of focus on um, defeating sort of globalist and this globalist um, ideology or a globalist agenda, which can be variously connected to the United Nations, to NATO, to other various international organizations, and sort of the rebirth of the nation, right? This is the Make America Great Again um, idea behind the campaign slogan. So I just want to look at one or two sort of clips to think about how these populist expressions um, were coming out in the various speeches and events uh, for former President Trump. So you can hear a lot of those sort of uh, populist sentiments that Steger identifies and others talked about. Right? These are all very clear on the campaign trail before the election, but in that sort of defining moment of the inauguration, right? these ideas were highlighted um, once again. So as you can see from these different examples, right, these growing political debates about globalization, um, we can think about them productively through um, this idea of ideology and these three um, sort of different globalist frameworks. So we'll continue thinking about um, these topics on Wednesday. Um, any final questions? Okay, thanks everybody. Stay warm, stay safe, stay healthy. See you all on Wednesday.